Hello everyone, welcome to the Smite Comprehensive Guide to Horus. Now, again, this is a continuation of discussing gods that I play in the support role that can heal. He is the last one. I will discuss why he is the last one of this series in general, but I'm also going to be talking about Horus from a solo lane standpoint as well, because obviously as a warrior he does fairly well in that particular regard. But first it's worth taking a quick look at his abilities, because I do want to actually talk about how these impact how you might approach building him in your own experience. Now the first thing I actually want to talk about is his passive Resolute. Now ignoring the set condition, we're talking about an increase to Horus's protections and crowd control reduction. And when this goes away after three seconds, this is a heal, right? Now, the heal in total does wind up being 170 unadjusted, depending on how you build your items, but this is actually often enough to make Stone of Gaia actually legitimately useful on Horus in situations where it wouldn't be necessarily that useful for other supports. Now, does this mean that you should build Stone of Gaia all the time? No. You still should judiciously decide when and where to build Stone of Gaia, but Stone of Gaia, due to the additional healing of Resolute as well as the additional healing of Protector's Surge, due to these two factors, Stone of Gaia actually makes for a bit more viable of a heal than on, again, most other supports. So this is something that you should keep in mind. This is also something I'll be talking about a little bit later on when I am discussing Stone of Gaia very specifically, but the only other thing I really wanted to mention is Updraft that Gust is affected by Hydra's Lament, but the Cleave from Fracture is not. Now, I'll be, again, discussing this in a little bit more detail, but it is really important to note. Now, I also want to point out the fact that Updraft, of course, this is a pop-up which lasts for about... I believe pop-ups typically last for an average of one second. There are some exceptions to this, but... If you see a knock-up, or a pop-up as I like to call them, assume they're one second long. And of course, Fracture is a 1.25 second stun. Now this turns out to be 2.25 seconds, which is almost the full three seconds you need for a Resolute Heal. So in other words, if you blast your full crowd control on an enemy and they don't immediately attack you afterwards, you're probably going to heal, which is why Stone of Gaia is a bit more viable with Resolute. This is why Resolute is fairly consistent. In fact, I have Resolute trigger at least three times in most fights, team fights specifically, sometimes more, depending on the size of the team fight. Like if I'm not going, if it's not a full 5v5 situation, sometimes it'll trigger more often than three times. But you can actually expect Resolute to trigger multiple times if you're pulling your crowd control correctly, right? There are going to be times where you're only using one piece of crowd control. There are going to be times where the enemy attacks you, attacks you hyper-aggressively. There's going to be times where enemies are, you know, attacking you so often this never goes off cooldown, right? It never fades and heals you. But there are also going to be those team fights where you are constantly getting healed by this because... Every, you know, you're being left alone for three whole seconds due to your crowd control and the enemy actively ignoring you, right? Which some people react to supports, enemy supports, by trying to ignore them, by trying to get around them. And you can, in fact, sometimes use that to your advantage by allowing your resolute to fade and then getting back in there. This is also really great because if you are chasing someone and, the, you know, they're obviously not attacking you, this fades, you get a heal to give yourself at least a little bit of a health boost on your pursuit, and then if they turn around to throw random abilities at you, you can basically just face tank those abilities for the most part, get more stacks, and heal at least some of that damage back up, right? So it is a really interesting and surprisingly useful passive from a support standpoint that not a lot of people think about because they don't actually have to do anything specific for it. So let's talk about building Horus, right? Now I'm going to start from the support perspective because this is how I personally prefer to play him, and then we will talk about Solo. Now, when playing Horus as a support, I typically run Sentinel's Gift, at least in Conquest. In non-Conquest game modes, this is going to vary a little bit more depending on the needs of the team, but generally speaking, I am going for Sentinel's Gift. I very rarely build Warflag on Horus because 
since he himself is looking to alternate abilities and auto attacks, attack speed is not really something he can use a whole lot. Now, I'm aware of the fact that increased attack speed makes for better auto attack canceling, and I am aware of that, but that still doesn't fully utilize attack speed to its actual maximum potential, since you're not standing there literally just belting out large quantities of auto attacks, right? So, while you getting attack speed isn't necessarily a bad thing, it still can help you a little bit, that help is not really going to... Any attack speed boosts aren't really going to help Horus out, and there are certain occasions where I have built War Flag on Horus despite this. I have say I have an unusually large number of auto-attackers on my team. Now, this is extremely rare, at least in Conquest and in most game modes in which people pick. It's happened a couple of times in Assault, where I've been Horus and my entire allied team has been auto-attackers, right? Uh, I believe there was one game about a month ago, I distinctly remember this because I thought it was unusual that I had to build War Flag, but I was Horus, and my allies were Sol, Kronos, Artemis, and I think Ho Yi or Hachiman, I can't quite remember. And, of course, all of them are auto-attackers, so I, I went into War Flag. By the way, we did not win that fight. <laughs> but I built War Flag in that particular match because it was more important for me to help my auto-attacking allies than myself being as strong as I could be, right? However, you will find in a majority of your games as a support Horus that Sentinel's Gift is going to be the better choice. Now, there are a couple of reasons for this. And namely, once again, at least for the early and mid-game, you're getting the passive healing from Sentinel's Gift, which is, you're going to be your third heal. Your passive, your, your healing, flight, I can't remember what it's called for the life of me. Those both will heal you, and then you've got Sentinel's Gift on top of that. However, in Conquest specifically, I've mentioned this before with other supports, and I'm going to mention it again, in Conquest specifically, I don't build Sentinel's Boon, because it really does very little for you in teamfights, right? Sure, when you get an assist on an enemy kill, an enemy god kill, you're going to get some of that health back, but then again, Sentinel's Embrace, you're actually actively giving your allies protections, and Horus is very unusual in that his third ability, he flies directly to an ally and heals them and increases their protections. So I've personally found, through both personal experience and just by running the numbers, that Sentinel's Embrace is a much more effective evolution for Sentinel's Gift on Horus, because you can basically almost guaranteed provide the protections your allies need in their time of need. If you see an ally in trouble, you can fly to them, boom, healing, and two different ways you're increasing their protections. Sentinel's Embrace is increasing their protections via the aura, and your heal is also increasing their protections. And in fact, this is one of the reasons why I am unusually fond of building Gauntlet of Thebes on Horus. Now, I still only build Gauntlet of Thebes nowadays, in team compositions with three magic, two physical, that's about the only circumstance in which I am still building Gauntlet of Thebes. Nowadays, once again, due to standard team compositions, I am usually going into sovereignty, but it is really interesting to note that a defensive aura is unusually effective on Horus in a very unique way, namely, that you can get to your allies a lot faster than any other support in the game via this ability. Right, obviously it still has a range, so I think the only one who can beat you out in this particular aspect, or beat Horus out in this particular aspect, is Athena, but that's via her ult, which has a much longer cooldown than the ability in question we're talking about, Protector's Surge. This only has a 16 second cooldown, right? Now, it's also fairly interesting to note that this has an unusually long range, this is a much longer range ability than normal. Right, I, I can't really show you in jungle practice. You'll have to see this when I give you a conquest match to watch. But do be aware of the fact, at least for now, that Protector's Surge has a longer than average range. So you can actually fly to and heal and protect allies from an unusually long distance. So to that end, not only is Sentinel's Embrace unusually effective, but so are any defensive aura, such as Sovereignty. And again, Sovereignty is my usual go-to at this particular point in time due to, once again, standard team compositions. So this is generally how I like to open a lot of my Horus games. All right. Now for 
magic protections, which should be your third item. Well, I say your technically should be your third item. My third item nowadays typically tends to be Manticore's spikes. And there are several extremely important reasons for this. Despite the fact that you technically only have two consistently damaging abilities, your third ability doesn't do damage at all. Right, what's up with that? A couple of really interesting points here. Both of your first and your second ability, the gust and the dash, they both generate a spike. Right, so Horus, unlike a lot of other supports, is much more able to consistently produce two spikes. There aren't many other supports that can do this effectively. Bacchus comes off the top of my head as one of the few, Kabraken as well. But beyond those two, generally speaking, most supports are only really able to consistently generate one spike. Every so often, another support I can think of is Sobek. And these are the only ones I can really think of that can consistently generate spikes. So, not only do you have that, but you have both protections and you have MP5. Now, MP5 is important for Horus in the same way MP5 is unusually important for any and all healing supports. Namely, that you want to have the mana available to heal your allies. Alright? Very important. So, my third item typically tends to be... Uh, Boink, boink, and boink. Typically tends to be Manticore spikes. Usually. Alright, even if my second item is very specifically Thebes or Magical Protections, in this case, if I really needed Magical Protections for my second item, by the way, I use Heart Ward. If I need a Magic Protection replacement for um, for Sovereignty, I'm going Heart Ward. Which shouldn't surprise anyone here. I mean, if they have four Magic Damage Sources, or if I see that their dual lane is likely to be double magic, I'm going heartward, right? Anyways, back to the point. Manticore Spike is unusually effective on Horus, and it's now my fourth item that I usually bring in the magic protections. Now, what those magic protections happen to be, at least personally, this is my personal preference, I like to run Bulwark of Hope a lot of the times, right? as a personal preference. Now, the reason why I really like Bulwark of Hope is actually, it comes back to the, all that healing he can do. Bulwark of Hope's shield gives you a surprisingly large window most of the time to heal yourself back up to an acceptable point, right? And that's very, very effective. That will typically keep you alive for a good amount of time. Now... My fifth item typically tends to be Pridwin, and I actually want to put an asterisk on this because I mentioned that my fourth item is usually Bulwark of Hope, right? The reason for that is because right now the meta really rewards aggression. Aggression is really a popular strategy, and it usually works. As a result of that, team compositions overall right now are more aggressive. They're higher in damage dealing, etc. Bulwark of Hope, I have found more often than not, is... A better option for me to stay alive than Pridwin. However, against less aggressive team compositions, or if you personally just prefer, Pridwin as a fourth item and Bulwark of Hope as a fifth item is equally viable. This is something you're going to have to come down to personal preferences on, right? My only real issue with Pridwin compared to Bulwark of Hope is Pridwin happens specifically on your ult, which is great, but you're already getting protective benefits from that, whereas Bulwark of Hope is activating basically whenever you need it. It's not tied to anything, it's just activating whenever you're low on health, right? So, in my opinion, Bulwark of Hope tends to be a bit more consistently effective for keeping me alive than anything else. However, again, if you personally prefer running Pridwin as your fourth and Bulwark of Hope as your fifth, that is totally fine. Completely acceptable. Now, my last item tends to be fairly interesting from a support standpoint, but I'm really fond of Hydra's Lament. And this goes back to the gust um, from your updraft ability that is affected by Hydra's Lament because it technically qualifies as a passive. Furthermore, your heal is somewhat dependent on your power, so even though it's not giving you any defensive benefits. It is giving you MP5, of course, which we talked about is very important. It gives you another 10% cooldown, and it gives you 40 physical power. Now, because his heal is only a 10% scaling, that's only 4 extra HP of healing, but, you know, 
better than nothing. Really, the main reason you are building this is for a nice bene a, a nice increase in your gust damage, which it already is being increased by 50% if they're still in the air, so that's very, very effective, right? It just is a really nice damage spike that not a lot of people expect, and some penetration never hurts on that regard either, and again, the HP-5. Now... This is just how I personally like to run a nice support Horus. There are a couple of other items worth talking about if you really prefer them. Now, if you're going for a more aggressive Horus style, and this is something I like to address because, as I mentioned earlier, the meta does reward aggression a little bit more, instead of Sovereignty, you could choose to go Gladiator's Shield to add a little bit more oomph to your damage output. I, again, personally don't like this because I'm more of a traditional support and I like to keep my allies alive, and again, as I mentioned earlier, Horus is unusually good at providing needy allies with protections in their hour of need. So I personally prefer to go with the Aura, but Gladiator's Shield is an equally effective option, and in fact, Void Shield is an unusually effective option for a very similar way. But, let's talk about Void Shield really quick, because what a lot of people forget with Fracture is that it's actually reducing protections by 30 slap Void Shield on top of that, which is a 15% protection reduction, and you can have a substantially and surprisingly powerful negative effect on the enemy's protections. And if you feel like you would prefer Void Shield over Hydra's Lament, totally viable. Or Gladiator's Shield over Hydra's Lament, totally viable. Which is why I'm talking about them now. Hydra's Lament is my personal preference for my last item because it's a nice damage spike, and Horus unlike a lot of his support contemporaries, due to resolution, uh, Resolute and also Protector's Surge, he often has higher protections than his items would indicate. He's a little tankier than average. Thus, he can actually get away with not building as much protections on his last item as a lot of other supports would. And as I've mentioned before, I like to splash just a single damage item into my support builds nowadays because, once again, the meta appreciates that. So building either Gladiator's Shield or Void Shield as your final item is a surprisingly very effective stratagem as well. However, a brief note on the Void Shield, I only am willing to build this if it's a if my my allies number at least two other physicals. Again, most team compositions do have multiple physicals. You yourself are a physical as a warrior. You're usually going to have a physical hunter. Your solo lane is usually physical. Now, that might change. A lot of people like to play a magic solo lane when their support is a warrior, but I digress on that one. But only really bust out Void Shield if there's three plus physical damage sources on your team, including yourself. Otherwise, it's generally not going to be worth it if only you and one other person are getting the benefit of this. It's generally going to be better to go Gladiator's Shield because that's going to mean more, right? Now, if I would... If I were to replace Hydra's Lament, again, I usually go into Gladiator's Shield, if not Hydra's Lament, and again, if I do this, it is in reaction to a more damaging than average team composition. As of late, I've found myself building Gladiator's Shield more often than Hydra's Lament, because that's just what the meta calls for nowadays. So, if you're going to experiment with Horus, I do recommend throwing on a Gladiator's Shield as your final item, and seeing how that feels first, because right now, as the meta stands, this is more likely to be effective for what you need, rather than Hydra's Lament, which absolutely is going to hit harder with the Gust, but maybe you need the protections a bit more, and Gladiator's Shield still maintains that 10% cooldown reduction, so I'm still maintaining the 30% cooldown, right? So that's a really nice thing to keep in mind. Another thing that I find unusually effective on Horus in situations that not a lot of other supports are really able to take advantage of is rune forged hammer. Now most supports either don't really deal a lot of damage or they really just you know they they have the crowd control but they don't have anything hard hitting enough. I think the only other support that I would build Rune Forge Hammer on, conceivably, would be Kabraken, but there are better items on him. But for Horus as a final item, this is actually fairly decent, um, particularly in Conquest, where you have the HP and MP5 benefits. But this also serves to really work well with Updraft, where your basic attack does an extra 50%, your basic attack gust does an extra 50% if the enemy is in the air, basically. So not only are you getting 100% of your basic attack damage, which under 
the famous Runeforged Hammer, you're looking at 109 plus 70 plus 20 percent of that plus 50 percent of that so basically you're increasing that by let me see that would be 179 plus 7 right or times 1.7 I should be a bit more specific here so you get a lovely increase of 80 extra damage which isn't bad Right, so Runeforged Hammer, I don't often talk about it because there's not a whole lot of gods it's useful on, but Horus is one of these that also happens to incidentally affect the second hit of Fracture. Now, I also want to take a brief moment to mention that the second hit of Fracture does not count as an auto attack. It is not affected by Hydra's Lament. But, the attack you pull after that second hit, the regular auto attack afterwards, is affected by... Hydra's Lament, and the enemy will have reduced protections, so even with Fracture not directly activating it directly, you still get a lot of benefit out of Hydra's Lament with Fracture. So that is something to keep in mind there as well, but Runeforged Hammer is a potentially useful item on Horus in a way it isn't on a lot of other gods, so that is also worth mentioning. Now, I do want to also mention that instead of Bulk of Hope, you could go Fae Blessed Hoops. I am more likely to build Fae Blessed Hoops in, ironically, non-conquest game modes. It's I find it very effective in Arena and Slash very specifically due to the fact that I am more likely to heal multiple allies, because when you fly to an ally under Protector's Surge, you are healing in a small area around you. So any allies close enough will also get healed and drop a flower. However, this isn't terribly common, and I even when I do build Fae Blessed Hoops, it's not necessarily to replace Bulwark, but it's actually because the enemy team composition is so stocked with magic damage that I just need the extra magic protections. So in most situations, when you bust out a Fae Blessed Hoops, you're only healing two people, yourself and the target of your protector's surge, and therefore, at the end of the day, what you're actually getting is just two flowers. Again, this is a bit more useful in Arena and Slash, and if you happen to play Horus there, Assault. But beyond that, in Conquest specifically, and also in Joust, it's really not going to trigger often enough or to enough people to really make it worthwhile in the long run. The only real exception to this that I might recommend you build Fae Blessed Hoops is if you intend to build Void Shield or Runeforged Hammer as your last item, it might be worth investing in Fae Blessed Hoops to maintain that 10% cooldown reduction. But that's going to, again, be a personal preference of yours. It also has the happy accident of replacing the MP5 you would be losing by not building Hydra's Lament. So, if you prefer Fae Blessed Hoops over Bulwark of Hope, that's perfectly fine. Adjust your last item accordingly. Right? But it is worth mentioning that Fae Blessed Hoops can be very effective. I just find it more effective in certain other modes. Right? Now, again, Stone of Gaia, I want to talk about this. Again, this is a bit more effective on Horus due to all this healing than on other supports, but I'll still generally only build this on enemies, on enemy team compositions with enough what I call displacement crowd control, the knockback, pull, push, grab, pop up, whatever. These all trigger Stone of Gaia, which is really lovely, and if the enemy team composition has enough of those effects, I'll bust out Stone of Gaia as my last item. Or, well, I say my last item, I really actually push it usually to my fourth or fifth and just readjust, you know, what would normally be my fourth item would be my fifth, and what would normally be my fifth item would be my sixth. Generally speaking, that's usually how I actually do it. But another thing that I don't really build, I, I sometimes build Stone of Gaia there, but under those specific conditions, I don't really build Shield of Regrowth despite the fact that I am in possession of a self-heal with Horus. Now, the reason why is because whenever you're flying to an ally to heal them and to give them protections, Shield of Regrowth would be great if you were trying to run away from that situation, but a lot of the times you're not. You're looking to immediately start body blocking, right? So your need for movement speed after using Protector's Surge is not very frequent, all right? Now, I'm not saying there isn't a use case for this. There is sometimes, um, particularly if you are specifically with a very aggressive player and they're looking to chase all the time, Shield of Regrowth will really help with that. But those situations aren't common enough for me, at least 
in my experience, for me to be able to sit here and recommend you build Shield of Regrowth consistently. There might be a use case for this. You might prefer it yourself, so it is at least worth trying. But I want to warn you that a lot of the times, you're not going to be taking advantage of the move speed boost from Shield of Regrowth. And quite frankly, 15 physical power, while yes, it does increase your healing, your healing just came off cooldown. So by the time that comes, you know, or you just went on cooldown, excuse me, by the time your healing ability comes off cooldown, you're actually not, you don't, you no longer have that 15 physical power, right? So treat this one with caution, but I don't recommend Shield of Regrowth, generally speaking. But again, it might work out for you. Mail of Renewal is actually an item I have had some success with Horus on. Again, all this healing combined with the passive heal of Mail of Renewal works really well. But again, I do personally find Mail of Renewal slightly overrated. I don't build this a ton, but it is worth mentioning at least for now. But just as a kind of a side there. But beyond that, that's generally how I approach Horus from a support standpoint. Alright? From a... Solo lane standpoint, I'm usually going to run Warrior's Axe. Now, there are a couple of reasons for this. First off, uh, the health and mana increase, right? The healing, again, combos really well with his natural heals that he has. But then we also have, uh, with Sundering Axe, your protections will increase the amount of healing you get, your protections from items very specifically. But nevertheless, that can be very effective, you know, especially when you're busting out the damage from the updraft and also fracture these are quite substantial damaging abilities themselves if used correctly and sundering axe popping whenever you use one of those is incredibly damaging so i really like just how his abilities really combo effectively with the warriors slash sundering axe and really give you a really nice benefit in uh, bonus in your health and your mana all right. Besides that, I do generally tend to build Horus very similarly as support Horus. This shouldn't surprise anyone. I've mentioned it before. I men I'll mention it again. I typically build in the solo lane pretty similar to how I build in the uh, support role. But it is still going to be a certain amount of mixing up according to what the enemy is. Now, if the enemy is physical, I am usually going to go into a nice gladiator shield or... Hydra's meant first, it depends on if the enemy is squishy or tangy. A lot of the times I'm running Hydra's Lament first because a lot of the times my landing opponent is either a guardian or a warrior, and usually these people, these characters, build protections either as their second or third item, right? So you'll already have the penetration with Hydra's Lament, you'll have enough MP5 from both the baseline stats and its passive, where even if your blue buff gets stolen you're totally fine on mana. And that's a very important thing for Horus because Horus only has, just like Guan Yu, two damaging abilities. But unlike Guan Yu's Taolu Assault, which is a devastating change in the tides, Horus can devastatingly change the tides, but only against certain characters, right? Anybody who is immune to pop-ups or has consistent immunity to pop-ups, like, say, Chang Ah can jump, you know, she can dance out of that if she anticip anticipates it correctly, or even more likely, she anticipates your fracture and dances out of the way of that, as an example, though. But, uh, you know, besides that, it's very effective to generally go Hydra's Lament first, um, because those you only have the two damaging abilities, so it's not unusual for Horus to struggle a little bit in the boxing part of solo laning specifically. So it's more likely that you will lose your blue buff than for a lot of other solo laners. Thus, Hydra's Lament kind of mitigates that risk by a substantial amount by giving you some bonus MP5 without the need for a blue buff. So I typically go with this first and then go into Gladiator's Shield. Then I'll usually go into a dual protection. Either it'll be Pridwin or more likely, like I just said, Manticore's Spikes. Then I'll build some magic protections. And then we roll from there. But besides the first item being Hydra's Lament, and then either going Gladiator's Shield for a physical opponent, or I'll build um, Fae Blessed Hoops, or Bulwark of Hope. Usually in the solo lane is Bulwark of Hope, honestly. But if it's a magic opponent, Bulwark of Hope. If a physical opponent, Glad Shield is my third, so we'll typically go along the lines of this, this, and either this, or this, the Gladiator's Shield, or the 
Bulwark of Hope, and then I'll finish up with either Manticore Spikes, which is what I usually go for in the solo lane, or Pridwin, right? Sometimes I'll build Pridwin because it's got nice cooldown reductions as well, but beyond that, there's not really a whole lot of other things I build differently from the solo lane. Every once in a blue moon, if I need extra damage, the Crusher is really nice because it is going to give me additional damage on my abilities, which is lovely. And every once in a while, I'll build against particularly heavy, uh, fi particularly physically heavy comps. I'll bust out a Breastplate of Valor instead of Pridwin. It happens occasionally. Or if the enemy team has a lot of crits, I'll go Spectrals. I have gone Contagion as well for anti-healing every once in a while. Same as Pestilence. Sometimes I'll go Pestilence instead of my usual magic protection item, right? Uh, but beyond that, really, there's not a whole lot else I really change up with this build here. Right? You know, if I'm having... Uh, it's worth mentioning Caduceus Shield. I'm not really fond of this because healing, generally speaking, isn't powerful enough where a 20% increase is going to matter that much. The stats of this are good, and sometimes if I have an unusually powerful healer, such as, say, uh, Hell, or maybe someone with a really powerful self-heal like Hades, I might build Caduceus Shield as my last item, either in the solo lane or in the support role, either one, but it's not terribly common for me. But that's generally how I approach Horus in the solo and in the support roles. Now, it is very important to note also, rather than potentially building Pestilence or potentially building Contagion for my anti-healing, I have been known, as you can see here, to occasionally build Tainted Steel instead. Usually a pretty nice item. You can customize it to the defensive item you need against the primary kind of opponents that you're facing off against. You know, if there's a lot of magic damage on the enemy team, you go Tainted Amulet. If there's a lot of physical, you obviously go Breastplate, right? Sometimes if there's just a whole lot of enemy magic, and I'm in the solo lane specifically, I'll go for the Warding Sigil. If my landing opponent is a mage, and I see a lot of other mages on the enemy team, for example, maybe they have an ADC mage, a mid lane mage, and a solo lane mage. That's a lot of mages. So I would build Warding Sigil there. Now, I don't build this... Uh, in support, because again, Sentinel's Gift is providing me with health, mana, and gold. It's generally going to be more useful running the Sentinel's Gift in the support role than Warding Sigil. Even if the enemy team does have an unusually large number of magic damage dealers, it's better to stick with Sentinel's Gift in a lot of situations even then. Again, most of the time. But that is that is building Horus. You'll see some examples of this in the near future. But in the meantime, thank you all very much for joining me. If you liked this, please like and subscribe. If you didn't, please ignore me. And if you have any comments, questions, concerns, ideas, suggestions, or requests, please leave them down in the comment section below. And thank you all very much for joining me. And have a great 24 hours.